you took on flesh And you're so beautiful tribe of Judah and there is one found worthy the root take oh God and God you became sides are shaking, would you stand up really quick? your eyes. Don't look around. The Lord is going to touch people. Hey, you're so beautiful and oh God you became a man. Jesus just wants to touch you. And no you stood up, just lift your hands. The Lord is going to touch you tonight. Sing it, sing it. Every voice, every voice. Lord, I thank you for marking moments tonight. Marking moments, Lord. Marking moments, God. And no And you became a man. Come here, Luther. And you're so beautiful. Come on, sing it. Sing it. It's your moment, Luther. It's your moment. It's your moment. Fire of God, come. Fill him, fill him, fill him. Fill him, God. Fill him fresh, Lord. Fill him fresh. Fill him fresh. Oh 
minister to the Lord. Come on. Prophesy, prophesy on the cello. Come on. Come on, don't look around. Just, just sing to Him. Close your eyes and worship Him. Don't be a spectator tonight.
young people, Lord, lift your hands. Lift your hands. You want him? You want the Lord? Mark our children, God. Mark our children, Lord. Mark our children, Lord. And you're so beautiful. And oh, Jesus. Touch him, God, in Jesus' name. I want the kids to come up. I want the kids to come up. Come on. Come here. Touch him, Lord. Touch him, God. Touch him, Lord. Okay, on stage, that's fine too. Come on. Fire him, God. Touch him. Touch him, Lord. Pray for your kids, out loud, pray, pray. Touch Generation Alpha, Lord. Mark them, God, for your glory. Mark them, God, for your glory, Lord. Mark them for your glory. Mark them for your glory, Lord. Mark them, Lord, for your glory. We seal them as promise, God. Seal them as promise, Lord. Seal them as promise, God. Help him, help him. Seal them as promise, Lord. Fire on this whole family, God. In your soul, touch him. Touch him. Touch him. iPad and everything. Touch him, God. And you're so beautiful. Thank you that our children will not be, listen, our children will not be Ben Onai, but Benjamin. They will not be the generation of sorrow, but they will be the generation of favor and power. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name.
Lift your hands, close your eyes. Interrupt the meeting, Lord. Interrupt the meeting, God. Come here. Come here, Tyla. Vows and afflictions. Vows and afflictions. Vows and afflictions. Touch him now, Lord. Touch him now, God. He sees the vows and afflictions. The vows and afflictions. my young adult pastors. Thanks, guys. And you're so beautiful. Okay, lift your hands. Ask him to touch you. You don't need me to lay hands on you. Ask him to mark you right now, right where you stand. He's going to come on you like a wind. Ask him now. There he is. There he is. Ask him. Ask him. Ask him. Ask him. Fire of God, fall. Fire of God, fall. Fire of God, fall. Fire of God, fall. just wants to touch us. Fall. I thank you for freedom hitting this room, Lord, in Jesus' name. I thank you for freedom hitting this room in Jesus' mighty name now. Now, 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 in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. I thank you for freedom hitting this room in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Just a few more minutes. Just cry out for him to mark you. He'll do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. You got to ask him for it. You got to ask him for it. Come on. There it is. You got to ask him. You got to ask him to touch you, to make you. Come on. He wants to make you his everlasting habitation. Just ask him. Just ask him. Ask him, come on, ask him. Jesus. 
Jesus mighty name fight Keep asking, just five more minutes, come on. He told me it was gonna fall. He told me it was gonna fall. He told me it was gonna fall. Fire of God, fall. Mark a generation, God, with your glory, Lord. Who doesn't care what it looks like, what it sounds like. Pastor Daniel, come up here as fast as you can. Come on. Okay, do it again. Do it again. Come here. Right here. A new mantle, Lord. A new mantle for a new day in this whole house, Lord. Sickness will never touch this house again. In Jesus' mighty name. A new mantle for a new day. A new mantle for a new day. A new mantle. A new mantle for a new day. A new mantle for a new day. Worthy, 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 worthy. Fallen churches, God. Come on, begin to cry out for leaders.
soul for a new day. Unlike anything you've ever seen or experienced, I thank you for the anointing erupting God in Katie, Lord. Debs, she didn't even know was there.
Lift it, lift it. this room now in Jesus mighty name Lord give them what they're asking for those that they're praying for we speak healing now in Jesus mighty name Jesus mighty name
came up, you can either take your seats or sit down just for, I just want 10 minutes. Is that okay? Because then we're going to do something at the end. If you can, yeah, that's fine. I'm not going to, just stay with me. I'm not going to be long. Okay. Just keep doing that. Just stay on that. Christ that is not experiential, I do not want. A gospel that is not experiential, I do not want. The disciples said, him who we have seen, heard, and handled with our hands, it's him that we witness of. <laughs> him we have seen, we've heard, we've handled with our hands. And I think it's time that we start having dangerous meetings again. Like the ones that offend people. The ones that people begin to go, why are people falling over? Why are people crying? Why are people screaming? I don't understand. Any genuine move of the Holy Spirit, any genuine move of the Holy Spirit causes amazement, glory, but also confusion, according to Acts 2, causes offenses, according to Acts 2, jealousy, according to Acts 2. And I think for too long, we've tried to protect people from his presence. And I think genuinely there's a generation that's afraid to go into the mountain. It says in Ephesians 3, 17, let me start, oh, it's just all so good. 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength, you might have strength to comprehend. Strength to comprehend with all the saints, what is the width, the length, the height, the depth. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That word knowledge in Greek means science. To know the love of Christ that surpasses your logic. To know the love of Christ that surpasses what science can explain. I can't even begin to tell you how desperately in my heart we need to turn off synagogues and we need to get back to a temple filled with glory. We need to turn off our systems, our plans. I went home and made a plan. I literally did today. Joey helped me with my plan. He said, bro, I need some theological help. And then the Lord shows up. I come in, you guys are doing the wedding song. I said, what is happening in this room right now? And then I just started crying. And the Lord spoke to me about our team. And he said, they did it. They've listened. I'm so proud of you guys. I'm so proud of you guys. Literally, that was the actual like wedding song, right? You okay, Micah? No? <laughs> oh. You 
see, following the cloud is what distinguishes us. I'm not talking about resonation. I'm talking about you're either, listen, you're either in or you're out. And any great harvest requires separation. And I could feel it, man. I could feel it tonight as we're praying for people. Who does this guy think he is? Why are people falling down? I promise you, I promise you, there is a touch from God that'll change everything in a moment, in a moment. I, I have to share this testimony. I, um, I know that many of you have heard it, but some of you haven't and you need to. Y years ago, I, I worked for my uncle, Pastor Benny, and I was a catcher. I was catching people with my feet. I was diving, I was doing all the stuff and I wasn't feeling anything. And I would sit there in the services and you can't, you can't deny that something's in the room. I was telling our team a testimony about a man that, uh, that I used to work with and he said, bro, I have to repent to you. I said, for what? He said, I hated your uncle. I thought he was weird and flamboyant and had weird hair. He said, and I, and I went to one of his services so I could make fun of him with my friends. It's not a good idea. He said, and we sat in the back near the wall and we just wanted to see the circus. He said, and then your uncle did the thing in the section. And he said, and like a wave, I saw people coming toward me. He said, and I felt electricity go through my feet into my legs, out my hands, and throw me against the wall, and I fell on my face and repented. We we're like, where's that in the Bible? You remember when they come to Jesus in the account of John? Remember that? And, and they say, are you Jesus of Nazareth? I mean, a whole militia ready to arrest him. I mean, they got weapons, they got all kinds of stuff. And they say, are you Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, I am he. And they all fly back. Anyone ever catch that in the scriptures? And then you ask why, and then you think to yourself, wait, time out, they got up and they still arrested him. I'd have been like, you're good. I don't want any part of that. Or how about when the disciples would lay hands on people and it says that through, through, everyone say through, the laying on of hands that they imparted the Holy Spirit and it was so much, there was such a manifestation that a sorcerer wanted, wanted to give money for that thing. I mean, these, these men saw something. What, what was possible to the disciples, these men that saw water support his feet? I mean, their normal way of life was Jesus would just walk, he happened to walk past the funeral. Put his hand on the coffin, the boy pops up. I mean, what's possible to people? And you know what? I'm so tired of going to churches and he's not there. Because we're so concerned about what the people think. Who cares about what the people think? Whatever happened to Jesus being the main event? So I, I, I was the guy that was offended. I, I was the guy that like, these people are weird. And I'm wondering, I'm seeing people get up out of wheelchairs. I'm seeing tumors fall off people's necks in Wales, England. We watched a girl one time in, in, in London. We were in Westminster Hall. She had never walked in her life. And my uncle told my cousin and I, I want you to walk in a circle on the stage. And we're dragging this girl's feet on the stage. We're dragging her. And he's yelling at us as if it's like our problem. Keep walking. Have faith and keep walking. And I'm like, She's heavy, and before you know it, her feet start working. And there's just certain things that you can't unsee. And then you go to churches where they're more glorifying the schedule than they are His presence, and it makes you sick to your stomach. I am intentionally ruffling feathers because we need, we need a reformation to hit the house of God. We need the judgment of God to hit the house of God, and we need it to start at pulpits. And I'm saying, God, I'll be first. 
just wipe me out, break me, and then use me for your glory. Because he can't use you. He uses, he listen, he comes in you and he uses himself through you. So I was offended. And I was, <laughs> I was walking him to his car on a Friday night. I was walking to his car and I was thinking to myself, like some of you are literally right now, what is real and what is not? And as I'm thinking that thought, this offensive man turns around and he points at me with his long finger. And he says, why are you doubting the Holy Spirit? And it was like somebody hit me in the chest I was so convicted. I said, who am I to put borders on how God moves? I mean, you're talking about the one that hangs planets on nothing. You think he can't knock you over? You know that every time glory showed up, they felt like dead men in the scriptures. You know that you don't stand tall in his presence. You fall down and you sound like this, woe is me a man of unclean lips. I mean, this is the fear of the Lord. Even angels that came from his presence caused them to fall like dead men. People that just came from him. What is the glory of God gonna be like when it starts walking into churches? But you love your schedule. We rush in and out of the presence of God insulting his glory and wonder why there's no power. So I was offended. And I went to my hotel that night and I said, Lord, forgive me. I don't know anything. I'm an idiot. I don't know anything, but I'm empty. And if you can touch me, please do. Do Yeshua. Can you go into Yeshua? Thanks, bro. So the next day, you know, my uncle's services were like six and a half hours. Oh my gosh, dude. <sighs> Don't start singing it, because then you're gonna get lost, hold on. I hear some of you like, eh. Just hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because none of those, there's people that really need to hear this. Because there's offended people in this room right now, and I'm so excited about it. Okay, listen, hold on. So the next service, you know, my uncle, his, his like, his welcome was like an hour and a half. And, you know, he's being himself. And, and then, you know, we, they were so long that we, we, we did his services in four quarters. So third quarter, he's preaching, fourth quarter bodies hit the floor. And so they, you know, all the staff had like, you know, you can hear it in the ears. And, and it was always like fourth quarter, fourth quarter, fourth quarter. Boom, 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 boom. But it was third quarter. It was still kind of relaxed, you know. And I'm in the back. And I'm open. Just open. That's all it is. Just putting myself in front of God and saying, it's not really about feeling anything. It's just about being open. Because, you know, like you, you, you hear stories about Bill Johnson, right? He, he said that he went to the Toronto outpouring and he said everyone around him is on the ground and he's the only one standing. Anyone ever, that's, that was me before. And you're like, there's something seriously wrong with me. See, it's not about that. But he left with a seed. He said nothing was the same after that. For me specifically that night, he's just preaching. I'm not even listening. I don't even know what he's saying. Something happens to me in the back of a sanctuary. Now, up to this point, I said, I will never preach. I will definitely 100% not be a pastor. I'm not pastoral and people got problems. I don't like counseling. The Lord has helped me a lot. He's, he's been patient with me and so has our people. But you know, I was convinced my uncle would always say, you be ready 
is I'm gonna call on you. And I said, if you ever do that, I will run out of the building. I was petrified of public speak, petrified. And so something begins to fall on me experientially. Everyone say experientially. And I don't know how to explain it because I think God wants to, and I love what Todd says. He says, God wants to surpass your brain to get to your heart, right? So I don't know how, but I'm, you know, I'm on the floor and I don't know how I got there. All I know is that I'm crying and there's snot everywhere. And I come to it with my uncle banging on the pulpit violently saying, where is my nephew? I need my catchers. I am in no place to catch anybody. And I come wobbling up a, an aisle and, and listen, I was offended with that guy the night before. I thought that guy was, you know, a weird Christian, like one of those that just moves weird, you know, like Chip. Anyone ever met Chip? I love when he's not here because I just, not really sure what to do with him, but you're like, I like feel the Lord, but. And the next day I'm Chip. And I'm working my way down an aisle and I have no idea what's happening to me. Zero idea. And I'm trying to catch people, but I'm falling with them. And my uncle looks around this person and he says, you know, it's about time that you start preaching gospel. He didn't even touch me. And I go rolling down the stairs and you know, Pastor Costi and I in high school got in fights because people would throw their jackets at us and say, fire on you. And yeah, we went to a, a, a Baptist high school. So yeah, they, they weren't into Benny Hinn. And um, sorry, we just need to say what it is because like, what, what are we doing? So I, uh, after that moment, he said, you know, he did the whole pick him up thing. I said, oh, here we go. Down the stairs again. I couldn't till today. Couldn't tell you. I have no idea how I got on the floor. I specifically remember going into my secret place after that and experiencing God in ways I, I had never experienced God before. Now, I'm not saying it always is like that, but what I'm saying is, is that God is looking for a generation that is going to yank heaven to earth. And I don't know about you, but man, I'm, I'm feeling it. And I've been feeling the atmosphere of heaven all night. Like, you know, tonight was one of the first nights in my life. I have to say this as a leader, and this is to encourage you guys, as, as a leader for the first time that when I came up, I was afraid and I had no idea what to do. I told Kaylee, I said, I don't know what to do. I'm gonna go stand in the corner. I mean, I, and I'm believing, like, what if Sunday was like this? What if, what if Monday was like this and Tuesday and Wednesday where we came in and we were gripped with the presence of God? And, and, and it's not for show, it's not for hype, but what's gonna happen when heaven actually does hit earth? What's gonna happen to the atmosphere? But see, we've, we've adopted things from generation to generation to generation because our dad and their dad and their dad and their dad did it a certain way, but, but God's coming to a young generation saying, will you do it different? You, know, you go back all the way back to the times of Ezra. They, they reestablish, they reestablish the law. They, they, they get everything right. They read the law and people start wailing. They said, don't wail. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And Ezra and Nehemiah and this man Ezra on noonday on the Sabbath would get up on a platform and he would read the Torah. And when he would read the Torah, they would weep, they would repent, and then they would have community. And this has gone on from generation to generation to generation. But you see, this thing called synagogues began to come up. And Jesus, not one time, not one time identifies them as his synagogue. He always identified it as, I went into their synagogue. And synagogues sprung from the earth from this one thing. When Babylon came and invaded, they lost the glory, they lost the ark, and the temple was destroyed. And then synagogues are formed from the loss of glory and the destruction of the temple. And the Lord doesn't say, listen, the word doesn't say in Acts 15 that he's rebuilding any synagogue. He's rebuilding the tabernacle of David, which has, it says, which has fallen. 
just read Acts 15. I will, listen, I'm gonna pour out my spirit. That's happened, right? Continues to happen. And then I'm gonna rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen so that the Gentiles may seek the Lord. I'm gonna give the world, I'm gonna give the world a model that they can look to that they understand how to worship me. I heard Josh Snyder say it so beautifully. He said, I, he said you know, when, when, when something, when someone's looking up like this and just staring, that the natural instinct for us is to be like, See, this is what I believe is coming. Is that people are gonna walk into rooms and the whole, the whole group. And they're gonna go. But we've got synagogues on every corner. Places of community, it's good. Places of learning the word, that's amazing. I mean, we've heard it multiple times that the word, listen, the Bible says that the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. If you try reading this thing without the spirit, it'll kill you, it'll confuse you. But it's the spirit that brings this to life. So we're packed with people and we think we're successful because we have 1,500 people in our church and all this nonsense. But you see, there's this one thing about a temple that separates a synagogue and it's this right here, sacrificial worship. Sacrificial worship. You do not hear a sound of sacrificial worship in synagogues. Not a sound. What we have today is that we exchange the anointing for people. If, if we've got to cut somewhere, let's cut worship. Are you, it, it, it makes me, I think that it's intended to make us angry. And I think if it doesn't make us angry, there's something wrong. In Ezekiel, it says, I want you to go and find, I want you to go and find people that have a groan inside of their heart people who are not okay with what's happening in the world, people who are not okay with what's happening inside of the church. And I know we always say, say yes to the Lord, and it's easy, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus. But let me ask you, what are you saying no to? Because every yes requires a no. Every yes requires separation. Every common thing requires something uncommon. And I believe that God is raising a generation that has a resounding no in their heart. Not my kids. My kids are gonna grow up in religion. Nope, not my kids. They're gonna wake up in glory. Not, my kids, they're not, like, like, let me ask you a question. How many of you believe Romans 6 when it says that we can be set free from sin? I mean, you actually believe it. Some of you aren't raising your hand. I, I, I don't know, maybe you believe Romans 7 more, but, but there's, there's really this whole letter and it's really amazing. You don't, they, I mean, chapters were, were generations and generations later, but this whole letter of Romans 6, you can be set free from sin, you shall be set free from sin. And then you get to 7 and it says, to those that are under the law, they're confused. What they wanna do, they can't do what they will to do. They, they just can't figure this thing out. And then you get to Romans 8 and it says, but now, therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in. Everyone say in. In Christ Jesus. The, the, pas the passion says, now the case is closed and there remains no accusing voice of condemnation. It's something that you have to agree with. Right? But, what, but what's going to happen when a generation conquers sin? What are, what's gonna, what are our kids going to be like? Because I understand all kids are born in sin. But, but what? Just, just hear me out. What if? A generation conquers it. See, all of you, hey, raise your hand again if you believe it. So let me tell you, when you raise your hand, what you just said about your kids, they're born in Zion. Like, like I actually believe there's a day, there's coming a day where, where it says in the word that everything in heaven and everything on earth is gonna come together in one. This is habitation. Everything in heaven and everything in earth is gonna come together in one. And on that day, the presence of sin and temptation isn't even gonna be there anymore. And, and so I have this desire in my heart that, you know, when we do these 6 a.m. prayer rooms, my kids are waking up in prayer. And for so long, religion has taught us that when I get out of my bed and go brush my teeth, that somehow I sinned. 
What are you talking about? We call ourselves sinners because we want an excuse for our sin. See, when you call yourself a son, there's no more excuses. Oh, oh, I have to be who God says I am. I have to be worthy of the vocation. I've got to live worthy of the calling. Imagine that. But religion, listen, has infiltrated from generation to generation. And the world didn't put him on the cross. Religion did. The world loved him. They sat with him. They called him. They thought, how could you sit with these sinners? Called him a wine bibber. They called him a gluten. They found him relaxing with the world. For God so loved the world. He so loved the world that he came. We all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he came. And whoever shall believe in him shall have eternal life. But most miss 17, for he did not come to condemn the world. But that through him the world might be saved. The father was in the son reconciling the world back to himself. But you see, religion didn't like him. Because he messed up their system. And I feel a disturbance in the force. Some of you are like, oh, God, what does that mean? It's a joke. Anyone ever seen Star Wars? Come on, guys. But there's disturbance in the air, and it's a good kind of disturbance. There's a disruption in the air, and it's a good kind of disruption. It's one that separates the wheats from the tares. Pastor Gerardo said it when he opened. He had no idea what I was going to talk. It's one that consecrates. It's one that says you're either with me or you're against me. It's one that says you're either hot or you're cold, but you can't be in the middle. You can't have one foot in and one foot out. You can't, you can't just show up to church and think that because you, you got your 45 minutes that God's good with you. No, you got to burn on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, and Friday. But you see, I've got the things I've got to get. It done and I have news for you we're all crying come Lord Jesus come but do you realize that when he comes the future of what you thought you had is no more this is why Jesus said don't don't make plans listen pastors Jesus never not one time in the New Testament said here's my five-year vision for Jesus Christ International Ministries never one time not once he said, follow me. I one time heard a leader say, you know, you gotta be an easy person to follow. Don't change lanes too quickly. And immediately I heard the Holy Spirit say, Jesus was the hardest leader ever to follow. He would say things like, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And I mean, Jesus waited in John 6 until he had the biggest crowd. I mean, the biggest crowd. And he stands up and he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, knowing fully well they'll have no idea what he's talking about. It's not pastoral at all. And then they all start walking away, and he looks at the disciples, and he says, are you gonna leave me too? We don't have, any, we don't have pastors talking like that today. This would be like me just going crazy, people walking out and looking at them going, are you gonna leave me too? I think if Paul showed up today and started preaching, people would walk out. Because the, the type of scriptures that I read is, is he shows up in Ephesians 19 and flips Ephesus upside down. He causes a riot. Today we have green rooms and tea. They had riots and rocks. And we think that we're accomplishing something if 500 people came. Jesus waited till there was 15,000. This is my moment. He didn't put on Instagram. And just so you know, the gospel was effective before TikTok. Maybe you need to get off your phones for a little bit. My God. People need to experience Christ. You don't need more followers. He does. And the Lord is coming not just for revival, but for reformation. And it's not a new thing, it's a very ancient thing. It's the rebuilding of the temple where the point of the temple was they would minister to the Lord and his presence would come. What was the whole point? The entire, there was never any, any room 
before anything else. Second Chronicles chapter five, they set everything up, they began to minister to the Lord and the cloud came. And it says that the cloud was so thick, here's another one for all of you confused about falling. The cloud came and it was so thick that the minister, listen, the priest could not stand in the cloud as they ministered to him. Where is, that was in the Old Testament. Why are we not experiencing that today? Because we're in the way. Our plan is in the way. Our big vision is in the way. Our building program's in the way. All of this junk that God's saying, get the debris out of the holy place. Stop making my house a house of merchandise. You can, you can fluff it up all you want, but you're all, you know, we're all mad at the prosperity teachers until we buy something that we need money for. Jesus. See, here's my vision. David hired 10,000 people with his own money. He didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't spend his money on random stuff. He found 10,000 people, singers and musicians, and then employed them to surround a tent with a tap, with the Ark of a Covenant inside of it. And he said, all your job is, is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, minister before the presence of the Lord. That's what he paid for. That's what he invested in. And, I, and, and, and David got this vision of Revelation 4 and 5 that they surround his throne. And they cry holy day and night, ministering before the Lord, casting their crowns at his feet. And David got this vision as a king. David was not a priest. And I'm going to be done here. But David was not a priest. David was of the line of Judah, not the line of Levi. I need you to see something about this man. Only the Levites were allowed to be priests according to the law. But David shows up and this man is scandalous. He's a nutcase. He puts on a linen ephod and dances the glory into a city. Do you, do you know how, how intense that is? The linen ephod was only, only for the high priest. He wasn't the high priest. And we gotta learn the scriptures. He wasn't the high priest. He wasn't even allowed to do that. When Saul tried that in first, and listen, 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul tried to make a sacrifice, remember? It was kind of his demise. And Saul gets up and, and it says that I, he's, he starts making the unlawful sacrifice that only Samuel was supposed to do. Are you tracking with me? The unlawful sacrifice that only Samuel was supposed to do. And when he starts making it, Samuel shows up says, what are you doing? And here was his response. As the people began to scatter from me, I was compelled to do it. In other words, the sacrifice was for me. It was about them and because I have the fear of man and I believe that the Lord is destroying the man-pleasing spirit in the church. Because I have a man-pleasing spirit, I did the sacrifice and I got out of my lane and, and I did the thing completely out of order. And from that day forward, Saul loses his kingdom one day at a time. But here's my question. You, you just go one whole book later in 2 Samuel and David is making sacrifices. David is doing the burnt offerings. I believe it's in chapter 32. It says that David builds an altar and he began to sacrifice and do burnt offerings on it. He was no different than Saul, but very different than Saul. And here's the difference right here. Everything David did was for the Lord. And it moved God so much, it provoked God so much that he could not say no to this crazy man. Think about the boldness. He knew the law. He said, oh, how I love your law. But I'm like, you broke all of them. And we know that he's a type and shadow of Christ. I know that all you theologians, he's the type and shadow, the king priest. But you gotta understand, this was an actual man. This wasn't a shadow. This was an actual person that actually decided, you know what? I know it says this, but I feel this thing burning in my spirit. And, I, and God, I'm gonna be courageous enough to build you an altar. You know it's not for me. And then he comes to the Lord and he says, I'm gonna build you a house. Second Samuel 7, I'm gonna build you a house. Who does this guy think he is? 
the Lord says, you want to do that for me? You know, like I, I, God really used Corey in my life with this one revelation. See, I used to think it was like, okay, David, you're cute. You want to do that for me, David, I'm doing it for you. But then all of a sudden you see the Father's heart go, wait, no one's ever asked me that before. Not one person before him ever asked, can I build you a home? And he says, David, you want to do that for me? I'll take it one step further. I'll do it for you. And this man, listen, in Psalms 18, this man so provoked God, so provoked God, that in Psalms 18, his family had just been taken from him, stolen from him. His own people want to stone him. And, and listen, imagine, like, I have an amazing family. If someone took my family and my kids, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about anything. I would turn into, like, Jason Bourne. I'd be exhausted. I was tired today during worship, man. Oh my gosh, I thought I really have to do cardio. But I would turn into Jason Bourne. Here's what David did. He said, Lord, should I go get them? Everything about his life was God word. He inquired of the Lord and everything. And it says in Psalms 18 that he cried out to God in his distress. Can I read it to you? It's so powerful. Hold on, I'm just gonna sit down for a second. Okay. It's 10.05, you okay? Where else you gotta go? You're gonna go to church tomorrow. <laughs> I encourage you to be there early tomorrow, by the way, because our building is not this big. Okay. Listen to this. This is in, a dis this is in his time of distress. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord, my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and my horn of, self, of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Listen, the cords of death encompassed me and the torrents of destruction surrounded me. They entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. Listen to this verse six. In my distress, I called upon the Lord to my God, I cried for help from his temple. Listen to God's response to David, this one dude that was stressed out. In my distress, I called to the Lord and I cried for help. And from his temple, he heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. And then the earth began to reel and rock. Oh my gosh. The foundations also of the mountains began to tremble and quake because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils, devouring and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him, and he bowed the heavens and came down. Now I gotta stand up. He bowed, listen, bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet, and he rode on a cherub and flew, and he came swiftly on the wings of the wind, and he made darkness his covering and canopy around him. Thick clouds, dark with water. You still gotta, you gotta ask why. Remember why, David was stressed out. And out of the brightness, listen, before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire, and he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and flashed forth lightnings and, and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid. Bear at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent from on high, and he took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy. And from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity. Listen, but the Lord was my support. And he brought me out into a broad place. Here's why. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Dude, this man thought different. He rescued me because he delighted in me. There was something about this man that provoked God and he couldn't say no to him. This man wasn't a priest, but he was determined to be one. This man wasn't the guy on stage, but he was determined.
determined to touch God's heart. Psalms 132, he says, we heard about his presence in the fields and in the woods of Ephrathah. Remember when we were young, we would hear about his glory. And I think that as a little shepherd, God began to do something on his heart. And he said, I want that man. And he provoked God to come. You get to Acts and it says that in his life, he fulfilled all the will of God in his generation. It was like God wanted him to break the rules. And in Acts 15, the Lord doesn't say, I'm rebuilding the tabernacle of Moses. That would have been perfect. I mean, that was perfection. He didn't say, I'm gonna rebuild the tabernacle of Solomon. That was even more perfection. That would take nations today to purchase what this man did in that temple. He said, I don't want the pretty one. I don't want the perfect one. I want the one that was real. I want the one where that crazy guy threw a tent up in the wilderness. I mean, he didn't listen to anything Moses said it had to be. Every color, there was no outer court, inner court, holy place, there was just the glory. This man had some, you know. I see some of you really. It, it's mind blowing, it's mind blowing to me. He throws a tent up in the wilderness. And he hires men and women, and their vocation is to minister to the Lord. That's it. And God said in Jeremiah 33, if you can break my covenant with the day, with the night, with the sun and the moon, you can break my covenant with David. He says, there will never cease forever to be a man upon the throne of David, and there will never cease forever. Everyone say forever. For Levites, according to David, to minister to me. Everyone say forever. So we need a reformation called a Levitical one. Forever, everyone say forever. This isn't just history lessons. You know, there's, there's seven reformations, I promise I'm almost done. There's seven reformations in the Old Testament where it's frustrating to read. You have these kings that just, like they start really good and they end really horribly. And, and, and one would come along, and one would come along like a man named King Hezekiah. And at 25 years old, he would show up and he'd say, get all the debris out of the holy place. And he would go and they would pull generations after David's dead. They would go and they would pull David's old instruments out and dust the, get all the dust off of them. And they would restore worship and they would sing the songs of David, it says in 2 Chronicles 29 and 30. They would go and they would get his instruments and they would begin to worship according to the order of David. And as they did, the glory would come. And reformation after reformation after reformation. And I just believe according to Acts 15 that God is still looking for us to go get his old instruments. I believe that God is still looking for us to get back to the purity of worship that's only found in this one thing, Lord, we're gonna build a house for you, not for people. Lord, we're actually gonna, we're actually gonna get a community and we're gonna just put them around your presence and say, have your way. And for too long, we've had churches built around people and we have people that are still suicidal, that are still full of anxiety, they're still sick, their families are still dying, their kids are still not home, and we're just happy when we got our hour and a half. We need a reformation to hit the church. And it's time now of decision. It's time to say, Lord, I am all in. But you know that Laodicean church, they kicked him out, and here's what he did. He immediately turned around and started knocking on the door. The Lord is coming to a complacent, lethargic church. And he's saying, can I dine with you again? Go back to Yeshua. Oh yeah, there you are. This is the last thing. Hezekiah comes gets the dirt out of the holy place. He starts giving commands to the Levites, giving commands to them. Now you gotta understand, if you read, just, I have homework for you, read 2 Chronicles 29 and 30. But if you read it, 
they had a priest, they had priests, but then they also had Levites. And only Levites could be priests. You understand that? Only Levites, according to the law, could be priests. But not all Levites were priests. Right? So, so you had Levites, they, historically they would have to choose. Historically they would have to accept a function and the assignment, they would have to be chosen. So you get to, to King Hezekiah and he begins to come and he says, all these idols are in our hard places like we have today. A bunch of preachers with fog machines, tight jeans and no glory. One-liners, building Instagrams, building crowds and God isn't there and I'm sick of it and we're not gonna, we're, there's gonna be a resounding no in a generation that's saying no more. We want the power of God and only the power of God and we aren't exchanging the anointing for all of this garbage anymore. We're gonna get all the debris out of the holy place because there's too much of us in there. And he comes in 2 Chronicles 29 and he begins to give him this command and it says that the Levites arose. It says the Levites stood up. Not the priests, but the Levites, the ones that, dec- that would refuse to be who they were. And the Levites begin to do the work and it says that there was, the Levites were more upright in heart and they consecrated themselves more than the priests did. In other words, that would be like the, 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 the congregation was more upright in heart in consecrating themselves more than the pastors. But what you don't realize is you also are a priest. What you don't realize is in Revelation chapter five, it says, I'm gonna build, listen, he's giving us a kingdom and a priest unto the Lord. I will raise a kingdom of kings and priests unto the Lord. David found something that was always in the heart of God, of I'm gonna take them from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and I'm gonna tell them all, you are kings and priests unto me. Live your life to minister to me. And I will come and I will dwell on the earth among men. And I will hear, listen, the angels will cry that the tabernacle of God is among men. And the Levites arose. And the priests began to lean on the Levites because the priests were not quick enough to consecrate themselves. And inside of you, there is a priest that needs to awaken. Inside of every pastor, there is a priest that needs to awaken. And I believe that we are about to see a reformation as you stand to your feet. I believe that we are about to see a reformation called a Levitical one. We're gonna get back to true worship again, that's vertical. Like we literally could have ended after with everything and it would have been perfect. Because he's enough, that's all we need. We need an experience with him, we need to be marked by him, and then we need to turn our lives toward him. Let's lift our hands. Lord, we commit. Actually, put your hands down. Put your hands down. We're gonna make a covenant tonight. That's a big deal. It's not just something. We already did the praying for people and stuff, so we're good. We're gonna make a covenant with the Lord. And, and what I'm believing is, is that as you lift your hands, the priest is gonna stand up. Because this is what we need. That's what we need. Habitation. We don't need any more visitations. And my God, we don't need any more churches on a corner coming up with their, with their church growth plans. We... we Every church growth curriculum you've ever read in your entire life, we're doing everything wrong. Everything wrong. We worship for two hours. We sing the same songs over and over and over and over and over again. They say, you're not gonna be able to get the people engaged. Well, we're not building this for people. So, and it makes our lives a lot easier because we just don't care what they think. And, and it's not, a, listen, the best way we love people is we give them him. That's what they need. They don't need you. They need him. that the Lord is gonna take this cry throughout the earth, not risen nation. We're not even gonna put our name on our building, not risen nation, this cry, God is gonna take it throughout the earth and I believe it's gonna land on every church and every pastor and this isn't our vision, this is what we see in the scriptures. 
is that God is looking for his temple. How many of you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? God is looking for his priesthood. So I don't care if you go to Raise a Nation or you go somewhere else, if you're a pastor, if you're not a pastor. And I would say this, if you are a pastor, I challenge you to throw the schedule out the window. I'm challenging you. Throw the schedule out the window. The greatest thing we've ever done in our church is throw the schedule out the window. And it's amazing, you don't just make room for him, you give him the room. It's amazing what God does. So if you are going, Lord, I want the priest to rise up and I'm gonna live my life in a Levitical covenant that says I will minister to you all the days of my life. I'm not gonna wait on a worship team. I'm not gonna wait on a pastor. I'm definitely not gonna wait on another Moses. I don't care what's beyond the dark cloud, I'm going up the mountain. If you're making a covenant tonight, just lift your hands, both hands high. Jesus. Lord, look on your people, God. Look on your people, Lord. We commit to you, Lord, that we will build our lives around you. We commit to you that we will build our lives around you, Lord, that we will build our churches around you, God, that we will build our ministries around you and nothing else, Lord. We're not interested in ourselves. We want all of you, God. I want you out loud to just make a covenant with him. Give him your life again, but make a covenant with him that you will live to live, that you will live to live to minister to him. But this will be the point of your life. It's not about your calling. It's about the hope of his calling. He wants to crucify our dreams and all of our plans and birth his through you. Make a covenant with him. Come on. Five more minutes. Just make a covenant with him out loud. If you're a leader, throw this schedule out the window. Lord, we make a covenant with you. That houses of habitation, we prophesy, that houses of habitation are going to spring forth. That houses of habitation are gonna spring forth in Jesus' mighty name. Houses of habitation spring forth. Priests arise, priests arise. Levite arise, Levite arise. Come on, just five minutes, sing it, sing it, sing it. to live according Lord to Ezekiel 44 a Zadok priesthood that is not interested on standing on the outer court living our lives for men but God coming into your chamber to live to minister to your heart to sit at your table God get around these people Lord and feel fed we honor your name we thank you for what you've begun and I thank you that the gates of hell will not be able to stop it. 
we prophesy that houses of habitation will rise across this nation, Lord. That houses of habitation will rise across this world. Places built for you. Come on, agree. Places built for you. For you. We exalt your name, Lord. Thank you for the beauty of this weekend. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name. Can you guys give him praise? Come on, give him praise. Give him praise. Thank you, Lord, for touching us. Thank you, God, for marking us. Thank you, Lord, that you said, I will make you my everlasting habitation. Lord, come and dwell on the earth among men. Come and dwell on the earth among men. Come and dwell on the earth in our midst, Lord. We want to pull heaven down. We want to pull heaven down. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. Come and tabernacle yourself, Lord. Come and tabernacle yourself, God. Come and tabernacle yourself, God. Arise to your rest in the ark of your strength, Lord. Come arise to your rest, you in the ark of your strength. There is one thing that we seek. There is one thing that we desire, that we may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives. Anything and everything, anything and everything that's man-made will not last. Anything and everything that is man-made will not last. Unless he build the house, we labor in vain. So God, take us brick by brick, stone by stone. Take us brick by brick, living stone upon living stone until we become a dwelling place for, everyone say, for the Lord. For the Lord. Say it again. Say it again, for the Lord.